I'm glad you came back to watch another interview. And I'm Vonda Vaden Bates, and today I am with John James. John has a PhD in pathology, and maybe even more importantly, like our family, he and his family have had a very traumatic experience in the medical care system with his son, Alex. And I'm hoping, John, that you'll speak to that a little bit today. And let me just first also say a little bit about what I know of you. Uh, you are an activist for patient safety. You've written a couple of books. Uh, one, I think, was specifically telling the experience uh, called A Sea of Broken Hearts. And that really does illustrate the experience that you had with your son. And then later in 2015, you've published The Truth About Big Medicine. And I know that you've also created a number of white papers and you're published quite often. And what most people, if, uh, if they know you in your fame, which many of us do, they know of you because you really put yourself to task to try to get at some accurate account of how big this problem is, how big this problem is with people going into healthcare to care for and be cared for, and unfortunately having a tremendous amount of experience with harm instead or in addition to the care that goes on. So John, um, welcome, thank you for being here. And I would love for you to just begin by telling people about what makes this topic personal for you. Tell us about Alex. Well, yeah, Wanda, thank you for inviting me to do the interview. I appreciate that. Um, uh, many years ago now, I guess it's 19 years ago, uh, my son Alex was a junior at Baylor University, and he collapsed while running. He self-recovered and was taken to the hospital for where he was, was seen for four days, and then he was seen in another hospital for one day in Waco. Uh, he uh, was given a clean bill of health at discharge, and he went back to running. Uh, about two and a half weeks after his hospital follow-up visit, which was with a, an unqualified physician who was a resident in uh, family medicine. Uh, he collapsed and died while running. Mm. So then I look back and say, what went wrong? Well, I would say his care is probably a poster child for how to do bad medical care. Uh, he was harmed during his treatment. He uh, had a, a very painful hematoma after his cardiac calf, and he uh, had uh, copious bleeding after his electrophysiology test, both highly invasive procedures uh, at the end of his uh, stint in the hospitals. Um, his care was careless in this sense. His doctors knew he shouldn't run again because they hadn't really figured out what was wrong with him, but they failed to tell him that. They did tell him while he was loaded with Versed, which is a great drug that we, most of us have had at the dentist. It makes us forget what happened during our treatment. Uh, one would have expected that caution to be in his discharge papers, but it was not. And it was not passed along to the doctor that saw him after his five days in hospital. And so she didn't caution him against running. And so it was very dangerous for him to go back to running, but he never knew it. So there's a big communication error. The doctors were uninformed in this sense. There's a guideline for potassium replacement if your potassium is low and you have heart arrhythmias. He had three heart arrhythmias and he had a potassium well below the limit to do that. It was published in the major internal medicine journal called Archives of Internal Medicine then, um, about two years before all this happened. So it should have been well known. Uh, connection, potassium, and heart arrhythmias. And by the way, one is especially dangerous. It's a long QT, uh, which you may have heard of some of the uh, COVID stuff, some of these drugs uh, prolong the QT interval. Anyway, so they didn't do the guideline. They missed the diagnosis of acquired long QT syndrome, which had been around since the 1980s. Um, the other thing that I realized on hindsight was that his care was 
really unethical. Unethical because his informed consent was badly abused. Fear was used to elicit his signature on consent to have the cardiac cath. His cardiologist told him the story of, of Pete Maravich, a famous basketball player. Uh, those my age would know that. Uh, um, he died suddenly after a pickup basketball game when he was 40. His problem was nothing like my son's. He had been complaining to his doctor about pains and so on. Those were ignored. It turns out he had an occlusion in his single coronary artery, which was nothing like what the syncope or the collapse that my son had experienced. So, but that frightened my son enough that he agreed to consent to the cardiac cath. I remember he actually, his hand was shaking when it was time to sign the informed consent form. The other thing I learned that was really unethical uh, was sometime later, maybe about six months after he died, uh, the radiologist that had been involved in getting his um, cardiac MRI communicated with me at work. And we exchanged emails over the next maybe year or so. He told me through those emails that my son's cardiac MRI was never done right. Now that was critical because that was the gateway to the invasive tests. And they never told him that it was aborted, which is the word the radiologist used. He told me it could have been repeated. It turned out it was missing from his record. And I never could track down precisely why that was until the radiologist contacted me and said it was never done right. So very, as I said, poster child for how to do medicine badly. And I learned some things after the fact. That the medical board's not going to do anything. Uh, I took, took his case to the medical board. Uh, I was warned before I went by doctors that I knew that they aren't going to do anything. And they didn't. Uh, I tried to engage uh, through a lawyer, a cardiologist, about his care, um, but they circle the wagons. They don't, um, they don't rat on each other. And so uh, I, I found that that's a wall and, and that's not unusual. I mean, many professions and other things, they just kind of keep things to themselves. And so anyway, that's the story. It's, um, you know, I wish it never happened, but it did. And it sent me down the road of becoming an activist. And as you said earlier, I wrote a book called A Sea of Broken Hearts. The, the subtitle to that is a patient, patient rights in a dangerous profit-driven healthcare system. Mm. Profit-driven, uh, I had very good health insurance at that time. And so my son became kind of a cash cow. Let's do as much as we can to him because we're gonna make a lot of money on it. So anyway, that's reality. Anyway, a long answer to your question, but that's what happened to Alex. I, I thank you for those details. And I am, uh, unfortunately, I'm not shocked. I've heard too many stories that have very similar narrative lines since my late husband died in 2012. I know that you have taken a turn to try to educate, to try to bring awareness. You have taken stances and taken the stand uh, before Congress. You have really uh, taken, I think, you know, a, a, an approach to try to resolve this problem. And as you and I spoke about, even before we pushed record today, we're aware we have a long road ahead of us. Tell me a little bit, if you would, please, about what, what uh, encouraged you and, and what did you bring to the, to the equation of trying to get at some understanding of just how big this problem is, how many lives are impacted um, by this problem, which is one of, the, one of the accomplishments of many that you've had since your son died. Yeah, uh, I think one of the most important things that happened to me is some years after my uh, son died and I, be and I became an activist, I found other activists through a consumer's union group called the Safe Patient Project. 
and now it's called uh, Patient Safety Action Network. And there are other action networks out there that advocate for patient safety. So when we find each other, we can kind of hold each other up because often we get sort of uh, slammed down when we try to change the system. Um, I remember probably about 2008 or nine, I went to the Institute of Medicine, talked to an official there about my ideas. He said, those are fine, but there's too much money being made the way it is. So don't get your hopes up. <laughs> and I still am uh, see, affected by that cloud. Uh, one thing I did, about 2010, I was kind of sitting around and seeing that some studies were being done and published about the number of preventable adverse events in hospitals. A new tool had come along called the uh, Global Trigger Tool, which was very uh, capable of eliciting uh, errors out of medical records. It would first find uh, an adverse event, and then doctors would look at the situation and say, yeah, that was preventable or it wasn't. And that's basically equivalent to a medical error, although a lot of medical errors never cause harm. These were identified uh, because they caused harm. And so of the studies that, that were out there, there were about three good studies and then one pilot study. And I used those to publish uh, an article in the journal Patient Safety in 2013, in which I estimated upwards of 400,000 people are have during hospitalization suboptimal care that leads to an early death. That does not mean they died in the hospital. Uh, let me give you an example. In about 2000, there were about 100,000 people in the U.S. dying prematurely of heart failure. That's because they weren't being given the appropriate drugs when they went into the hospital. So that's an error of omission. They were not being given the drugs. In my son's case, if he had been given potassium replacement, he would have been fine. But his hypokalemia, low potassium, had caused heart arrhythmias that were life threat. And, and that's ultimately why he died. That and pushing his heart. Uh, he actually, when he died running, it was the first time he ran by himself. And I know my son, he had run with friends earlier and they poked, and it's not really working for him. But I know he went out and put the pedal to the metal, and that's the last thing he ever did. Um, so you, you kind of, well, okay, the reaction to that study was interesting. Um, I got some good feedback from some of those people that had been involved in the original IOM estimate of 98,000. Uh, they said, yeah, we kind of knew it was low at the time. Uh, didn't know it was this low. Uh, but I had a broader definition of what an adverse event was than what they had. For example, they didn't look at errors of omission that is an error caused because something should have been done for the patient and it wasn't, okay? Um, and when you start reflecting on the occurrence of those, there's a lot. And of course, a lot of diagnostic errors get overlooked too. And to be honest with you, the global trigger tool searches medical records. If it's absent from the medical record, it's not gonna find it. And I'm sad to say that a lot of things that are unpleasant won't get in medical records. I think most of the people that have had a really serious adverse that have happened to a loved one would tell you the medical records are not accurate. And in fact, in my son's case, they falsified his records to suggest he was offered a pacemaker and refused it, when in fact he was offered a loop monitor. And he did refuse that. But once he's, you know, and I know that I was there when he got the offer. And I asked him if he wanted a loop monitor, he said no. But a pacemaker would have done something, and they falsified this record. So, anyway, another factor in all this. Yeah. Uh, Blame the patient. Well, and that, that, is a, um, that is a common thing. I can give you an example from our experience that when I began to study the prevalence of blood clotting after surgeries um, and especially lengthy surgeries and my husband had a number of high risk factors but it was an omission in the terms of there was never a formal risk assessment made nor was there a prescription made to help prevent what was a very common complication after surgery developing blood clots 
Um, there was no prescription made. He had had a brain bleed, and so what normally would have happened is he would have received heparin, but because they were concerned about bleeding, they did nothing. Um, so another omission. But what you often hear people talk about is that the patient refused um, refused the prescription, or they, they have another term for it. And what uh, people at Johns Hopkins, who really study DVT and, and VTE specifically, have identified is that it's not a refusal, it's a lack of education, that there's not, a, and it goes back to what you named, that, that the communication really has to be there between that care team and that patient and their care team around them if they are lucky enough to have family members and loved ones around. That really has to be in place. John, I want to make one uh, clarification and then a quick question. Sure. The, the 400,000 estimate is per year. Um, and I don't know, I don't think I heard that. So I just want to make sure people who are listening and may have heard that for the first time understand that that's an estimate per year, not total. And that really speaks to the the prevalence and the the um, significance and the volume, if you will. The other thing I wanted to just quickly ask you is the global trigger tool still being used? And if you if that's if it is still being used, how might we be able to see how that changes over time? If our goal is to decrease that is the same tool being used to help us see if we are effective at doing so as we continue to do things like this, raise awareness, speak with legislators, all the various ways in which uh, we are attempting to address this issue. Yeah, actually, that, that's a very good question. Um, the global trigger tool is still being used. It is not necessarily uniform across the spectrum of research. The people that do the research will adapt the tool to the study population. For example, there's a global trigger tool for pediatric care that is different than the care for adults. Um, one MD, I can't get his name now, David Clausen, is working on a real time global trigger tool that is something that will look at the record and almost real time and say, well, wait a minute, this is this is a mistake or an oversight. That's how I understand it. And I think I talked to him, uh, it's probably last year sometime at a, a seminar, and uh, he was pretty enthusiastic about being able to do it. Uh, it sounds rather amazing, mm -hmm. but we'll see. You know, the technology today is remarkable in what it can find real time. So yes, it's still around. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you know, I I have a great deal of hope also in our ability to use real time tools to navigate current decision making, and it seems like that's where David Clausen is going with that with that work. And I um, certainly hope that 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 work is successful in doing so. Let's turn our attention just slightly as we um, begin to really appeal to those individuals who want to do something, even if it's just become more educated about this issue. Maybe they have a family member or they've had an experience that they're wondering about or their healthcare provider and they go into these systems every day and feel uh, stymied by the lack of transparency that a, too many systems have that sort of uh, cover your butt attitude or the don't rat anybody out attitude. And what we know, whether we're delivering care or receiving care, what we know is that as soon as you shut down that information, you shut down the learning. And as soon as you shut down the learning, you perpetuate what actually could be resolved. And so many of these issues have clear resolutions attached to them, 
but the dissemination and the integration of those solutions is not in place because of that sort of cone of silence that is all too pervasive. Um, that's my opinion. You might say it differently, but um, we can. We no, can Vonda, that's 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 absolutely right. Uh, last year, I worked with um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, on uh, a document that included a section on learning systems. And I was part of the team that uh, came up with the recommendations based on the expertise that was brought to the table. And um, it's clear that that's the way things have to go. We have to learn from our mistakes collectively. And uh, of course, the first step in that is acknowledging it, which is against human nature. No one likes to admit errors and uh, denial is, is present. But you know, once we begin to do that and get really good learning systems, I think we can get a lot of the errors out of, of care. Uh, some of the issues are tricky. You've got like aging physicians mm. uh, whose capability is bound to drop off. And how do you graciously mm -hmm. and fairly deal with that? So um, it's, it's a tricky business. It's going to be evolutionary. It's not going to be revolutionary. It's not going to happen suddenly. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. I might say, probably last year, I had I kind of gave up trying to fix the system. I had tried to work with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to get better patient rights, and they didn't listen to me. They just didn't want to hear from a patient activist. They want to hear from hospitals. What are hospitals going to give? patient rights to patients the way they want them. No. But anyway, I tried. I think that kind of turned me to say, okay, hey, we're stuck with this system pretty much. Let's see if we can empower the patient. Mm -hmm. And so I had been dealing with some people on informed consent, which by the way is highly abused. I mean, what happened to my son is nothing unusual in terms of informed consent. Um, but what I found in my state, and I think California probably is similar Informed consent is what a reasonable patient wants to know. So who's a reasonable patient? How about if we ask some of them? So I actually did a couple of warm-up studies with some small groups, and then I did a national survey and figured out what reasonable patients want to know. And it's a lot more than they ever get in informed consent. But I'm hoping that becomes legally binding. I'm actually working with a couple of lawyers to get it in a law journal. For example, uh, people in the survey wanted to know if their medication was off label, which means it has not been approved by the FDA for the purpose for which uh, they need it, the doctor says. And those medications without scientific background, the backup, tend to be about twice as dangerous as normal medications that are approved for a given condition. So patients really want to know a lot of stuff. They want to know all their options. They want to know what's going to happen to them after uh, an invasive procedure. They want to know what it's going to cost, which you never do. But um, I'm hoping that that study, which I published last year in BMJ Open, um, will open the door to more patient voice in the system, and it will empower patients. As I said, I'm trying to shift now. The system is probably eventually going to get fixed. But a smart patient that's empowered is what is needed now to deal with the system and get safe care. So that's that's the point I, I want to make. It's power to the patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's that? Please be sure to share that link in the BMJ article so that I can associate it with this recording. And you're moving exactly where I was hoping we might close this interview. And that really is to speak about what do you recommend for the everyday person who's either going in to receive care or they're supporting somebody who is, or they're going into these hospitals to deliver care and they really want to do so safely for themselves and for their patients. What are some of the things that you think the everyday person really does need to pay, pay attention to? Well, you need to do your homework first. You need to figure out if you've got a good doctor, if you're just getting routine care. Uh, 
check hospital compare online to see how the hospital is ranked. Uh, check doctor compare. Uh, these are CMS websites. They're okay. They're not that great, but it's a start. Uh, talk to neighbors, you know, who's got good care where and what's going on. Uh, a lot of people don't have a choice about hospitals and you're just stuck. So now you're in the hospital, let's say. Um, you have to ask a lot of questions. Take an assertive ad advocate with you, if you can at all. Um, if you're advocating for yourself, if you're well enough, you've got to understand everything that's being done. Why is this test being done? And how will it change my treatment, depending on the results? Um, and I'm hoping at some point to have a little checklist of here's what your rights are when you go in a hospital. And you, the hospital knows what they are, and you know what they are, and by golly, they better be respected. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's another thing. In my son's care, one thing I looked back on and said, it was my mistake. I didn't trust my intuition. Mm. Early in his care, I had a sense that his older cardiologist really didn't know what he was doing. Just my intuition. And he wasn't interested in a previous electrocardiogram my son had had. And I thought that was a little strange. But I didn't follow my intuition. I could have brought him back from Waco to Houston and gotten much better care here. But we didn't choose to do that. Um, so trust your intuition. If you think something funny is going on and you can get away from the situation, do it and, and get other care. And in general, get a second opinion if it's something really serious that you've got to have treated. A good doctor will not discourage a second opinion. It has to be an independent opinion. Don't ask his buddy for a second opinion. Get it. Uh, from someone he doesn't know, uh, if he can. Um, and um, that's, that's about it. If you can really stay on top of things, uh, show them that you're journaling. You have the right to make entries in your medical record. They should take the time to show you how to do that. Hmm. So I didn't um, know that. You've kind of got to go in there, I hate to say, sort of like doing combat. You got to know. You got to know where the good guys are and where the bad guys are, and hopefully there aren't any bad guys. But, um, and when you describe a good guy or a bad guy, say a little bit more about that. What would somebody look for that would be an indicator that this person might not be right for your care? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. Vague answers. For example, if I say, okay, so I'm going to have a cardiac cat. And I happen to know the risk of a hematoma, which is what my son had, is about one in a hundred. And so if I ask the card cardiologist, um, you know, what's the risk of a hematoma from this? Uh, yeah, it's not bad. You know, I don't see them very often, blah, blah, blah. That's not a good answer. Mm -hmm. Quantitatively, doctor, what is the risk of you doing a cardiac cat? What are the, the bad outcomes and how often do they happen? Um, I think other things, for example, a doctor really not having enough time to listen to you. There's growing emphasis on shared decision making between physician and patient. And that requires the doctor to take time to listen to you and your priorities and your concerns. And even what you may have pulled off the internet mm -hmm. it may not be all that good, but it might be pretty good too. There's a lot of good decision aids on the internet and uh, that's not a bad place to educate yourself. It sounds like the words of wisdom that you're sharing from, you know, for the patient uh, or their advocate going in really work well for the caregiver as well to uh, to really take time to know your stuff stay up to date be specific really listen to that patient and their advocate for what they're interested in um, to take the time to do that and i would i would like to add to that just from you know from what i've learned is to uh, 
take the risk to speak up in a system that wants to squelch your voice that may actually jeopardize a, a role or a position and i understand the risks involved but the risks involved to the personal level um, have i think maybe a, an equal and greater risk to the patients that that are being served and it's going to take all of us, those who are receiving care, supporting care, giving care, to be much, much more articulate and vocal and adamant about prioritizing safe care in order for things to change at that systems level. Um, again, my opinion, and I'm always, I, I always find that you and I sometimes have the same idea, but different ways of putting it. So as we close today, put it in your words, John. Well, I, I very much, I salute what you've said. I could not have said it better. I think one of the big barriers to doing that is, is uh, need for service. It's too easy to take a frightened patient and sell them things they don't need. Uh, just a month ago, I had a good friend, smart guy, ran a major NASA space center, um, and he's retired now. Uh, he had shoulder pain. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, we'll do surgery on it, fix you up. He decided, nah, maybe not. Maybe within a month, his shoulder was fine. He didn't need surgery. <laughs> uh, and there's many, many examples of that. So uh, fee for service, I think, has got to. It's got to go by the wayside. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. I think it just kind of poisons the system uh, and, and causes a lot of overuse that leads to harm. The other thing I would say to doctors is you have to be realistic about what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I have an interesting book called I Didn't Know I Didn't Know. It's written by a physician called Aubrey Malinsky. And he writes up or maybe 80 different stories of where mostly physicians overlooked key things in the care of their patients. They didn't know what they didn't know. And so it takes a lot of reflection, I think, on the part of the caregivers, nurses and doctors, mm -hmm. to reflect on the quality of care they're able to give and to know when to hand a patient off or to form a team and say, listen, I cannot figure out what's wrong with this person. I want a neurologist and all this infectious disease. I want everybody to get together and let's put our heads together and figure this out. You got to know when to do that. You cannot be, oh, I can figure this out type attitude. Yeah. Get a team if you can. Anyway, That's enough advice. I, you know, and I've seen that work, by the way. Uh, one of my daughter's very good friends had a very sick six-year-old girl. She took her to the hospital five times before they ER, before they finally got a team together to figure out what she had. And she was a very sick little six year old, six year old girl. Um, and that young lady now, her mother says, I will not trust again. I'm done trusting. Mm -hmm. So trust, but verify. Trust it, but verify. And and I have seen it work as well. And then there's a lot of evidence-based science out there that really shows that when you bring, you are willing to admit that you don't know what you don't know and that you broaden that scope to get as much expertise as possible toward the the ultimate goal. Um, it helps. It it matters. It does make a difference. And And what I also hear you say is, you know, really dig for what the ultimate agenda is in any case. If you can get under the layer for that ultimate agenda um, and be honest about it, you know, um, then you have a you have a better connection or a better capacity, I think, to meet uh, where the actual care and safe care is going to happen. John, be sure to send me those links and I'll include them in this YouTube. I'll be glad to. Thing. And uh, maybe we'll want to speak again in a few months after I've been on the road for a while. And especially as I draw closer and closer to Washington, D.C. and Capitol Hill, I'll be calling on you. And uh, who knows, maybe by then in September, you'll even want to join me on Capitol Hill and go uh, knock on a few doors together. Thanks, I, I thank might you just do that. 
it's interesting, the patient safety day, September 17th, my son died on a September 18th. Oh my goodness, what that, uh, well, that's extraordinary timing. Well, all the more reason for us to keep talking yeah. about that. Maybe we'll see you in September. Yeah, I'd, um, as long as we're going to do some rioting. <laughs> we have a really wide range. You know, you've got the people who are definitely going to get there with the rioting and the vocalization and the, the fervor that I think does wake up and really bring this to heart. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I have met who really have that deep commitment to make sure people get how important this is. Um, and I tend to lean a little bit more on the just, okay, let's just, I don't, I don't feel like I'm a soft peddler in any way, shape or form, but I am, um, I, I would not, the, the word activist is harder for me to use, I will admit, even though clearly if you see my actions, I'm, I'm activating in, a, um, in the ways that I can. We've, oh, yeah, you are an activist. You, you want the system to change, not do. just, and maybe I'll bring some really nasty signs for you to hold up. If I <laughs> well, it'd be a good experiment. <laughs> well, you know, I'm all about the shadow work, so that would be a great experiment for me, and uh, I'm all for it. You can, you can get me to carry some stinky sign. So anyway, thank you for the interview, and um, given your journey, I have to wish you happy trails. Thank you. And given that we are heading into Memorial Day weekend, I just am with you and your family and um, honor the life of your son, Alex. And I'll note the honoring of my husband, Yogi Raj Charles Bates, and my grandmother, Margie Baden, and all the, unfortunately, after you build this up over years and years, millions of people who have suffered unnecessarily. And um, may our work continue and may it be effective. Well, and we have to honor them. We have to. Yeah, sure. There's no choice from my point of view. Yeah. So you're doing well. You're doing beautifully. Thanks, John. So, you so. too. Thank you. I'll speak with you soon. And if you'll hold on for just a minute, I'll pause record and we can debrief for just a moment. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye.